Hebrews 10 reminds us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but rather we're to meet together in order to encourage each other to love and to good works. We're glad to be able to provide these videos as a means of proclaiming the gospel and encouraging Christians in their walk. However, I want to remind you, this is just a supplement to your Christian life and not meant to replace the local church. So I encourage you, find a Christ-centered, Bible-preaching church and join yourself to it. look at worship and we're here of course in Colossians chapter 3 and if you mention worship today to uh, 10 different people you get 10 different ideas of what worship really is and so the good thing for us is is that worship has a 6,000 year tradition worship didn't begin now uh, didn't begin 20 years ago or 50 years ago Worship began with the first human beings, Adam and Eve, who walked with God in the cool of the evening, communed with God, and, and, and poured their hearts out to him. It continued as we see uh, um, uh, their, their children, um, as they gave offerings. One of those was not accepted, which also shows us that there's a way that God accepts worship and a way that God doesn't. So God tells us in his word what worship is. We see worship through the, the, the tabernacle days of Israel as they worship God. We see as God lays down principles for worship there. We see it in the tabernacle. We see it in the book of Colossians. As a matter of fact, as we've been looking through, we see the church gathered together there um, locally as we are today. And what we're going to see today is that it's, it's, it's similar to us today. It really is no different. We are a group of believers who've been called out of this world We've been baptized as believers, uh, showing that we belong to one another, brought into a company of believers, and we worship together. That's why the local church is so vital, so important. And so that's what we're going to see today. We're going to get a glimpse because what Paul does for us here in the words of Colossians 3, as he, he gives us a glimpse into a worship service. He gives us a glimpse into the local assembly of believers there in Colossae. So I want to read uh, Colossians chapter 3 and, and verses 15 through 17. Then we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. So you may want to mark your place or write this down. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 for a parallel passage that is uh, almost identical as Paul gives instructions for that church um, as to worship. So we as God's people should want to worship God's way, right? We should want to worship in a way that pleases God. And thankfully to him, he's given us his word and there's really no questions about what is genuine worship. So let's read this passage and then we'll pray. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father God, we are once again needy. As always, we are in need of your spirit. We're in need of revival because our minds are wandering, our flesh is fleeting, and Father, we need your spirit to make this service alive. We need this service, or we need your spirit to make this time in this particular service profitable for us. Father, we can't understand your word without your spirit enlightening us and giving us discernment and giving us the ability to obey your commands and living in that full freedom and joy that all those things bring. So, Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit now to open our eyes and our hearts that we might be changed because we've seen Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. So the parallel passage that I mentioned in Ephesians, very similar as Paul lays out again a prescription of worship for this local church in Ephesus. He says, verse 18, and, be not, uh, or, and, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is the bockery, 
but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your hearts, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a lot of similarities, right? Um, in our previous verse, and the one we're going to be spending most time in Colossians, he talks about the peace of God ruling in our hearts. And the peace of God ruling, that word there is the word for control. We'll talk about that in just a moment, controlling us. This is the same thing he's talking about here in Ephesians 5 when he says, do not be drunk with wine. When you're drunk with wine, what has happened? You're under the influence of, of, of a substance. You're controlled by something. He's saying, don't be controlled with wine. Be controlled or under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then will control the service and bring peace. Because again, um, that's very important as we'll see in just a moment. We also see the idea of addressing one another, encouraging one another, admonishing one another, right? We see a group. We don't see a single person up in a mountain somewhere waiting to have a special moment with God in, to, to themselves. What we see all through the New Testament is a corporate gathering of believers who admonish and build up and teach and encourage and yes, sometimes reprove one another. And so they did that there. And then he says, singing songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord with what? Thankfulness. There's another theme that we see with genuine worship, a thankful heart. So having read that and having that in the back of our minds, we'll come back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, and spend the rest of our time here as we break this down a little bit about what does genuine worship look like, and especially in the local church, because that's where God has ordained that we as his people gather together and worship him, okay? 15 says this, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There's that word again, rule, the peace of Christ, rule in your hearts, plural. Now, now we'll talk about this in just a moment, but look at the rest of this. To which indeed you were called in one body. So we're talking about, again, a, a gathering. We're called into one body, a gathering, and be thankful. We have thankful hearts. So although peace, the peace of Christ in other contexts of Scripture can mean an individual peace, such as in Philippians, he gives us a peace that passes understanding. Uh, that, that can happen, and it does happen. But in this context, Paul is addressing a gathered group of believers, okay? So that is the context we have to look at here. It's the idea, therefore, of peace ruling when people come together that are different. And that's, that's a miracle, right? So <laughs> let me just say something about Doug Moo and what Doug Moo says about this. He says the gospel, and this again is the idea that, yes, there is a place for individual moving of God in our lives. We understand that. We read our Bibles at home. Hopefully when we wake up in the morning, we pray, we have a time with God. We're not discounting that. There is an individual aspect. And so I like how Douglas Moo puts it together. The gospel is in, inescapably individual in its focus. Each of us on our own is called by God and responds in faith to God in different ways, right? Yet at the same time, the gospel is inescapably corporate we are called along with other people with whom we make up one body. So that's both, well, both true, right? We're, we're called individually by God. And if you heard the testimonies of people in this room, they would vary how God used different means and ways to bring them to himself and to call them to himself, right? But all of us were called for the purpose of uniting with one another. Never were we called by God to salvation, to be a lone ranger Christian riding off on our horse into the sunset. No, we're called to come into the fold, right? To join ourselves together with other believers. And so there's the context of what Paul's writing. And he says, once you've done that, let the peace of God, let the peace of Christ dwell in you. Let it rule, okay? So that idea of rule, that word rule there is, could be translated umpire right? That's kind of the idea. It's the one who controls things, right? In a game, who controls the game? The ump, the umpire, right? He, he regulates play on the field. This is what he's saying. When you come together as believers, we've got to let the Holy Spirit through peace regulate, right? Now, this is, this is a miracle. It, it, it must come from the Spirit because you cannot get a bunch of human beings together in a place and naturally have a long-lived peace. We're, we're our personality differences alone sometimes drive us to 
madness, right? Sometimes. Some of us, we grate against each other, say things, oh, you're driving me nuts. But what God says is supernaturally, in this case, when we come together as a body of believers in the local church, the Holy Spirit can rule in peace. And that peace can rule. As a matter of fact, it's Galatians 5.22 that shows us that the only way we're going to have peace is through the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and, and on down the road. So peace is the fruit of the Spirit. So we're not going to have peace together without the Spirit, without us individually as we come together surrendering to the Holy Spirit. And therefore, His peace rules in, in our means. Uh, Ephesians 4.3, write this down if you'd like. Here's the, here's the emphasis Paul places there on this thing of peace. He says to that church, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Work at it. Be intentional about it. It's the Spirit who brings peace. But he's telling us as believers, we should long for that, work for that, and be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the harmony of the Spirit, right? The oneness, this 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 cohort, so to speak, of, of collaboration that we have together in the bond of peace. It looks like peace. When the Spirit is ruling in the hearts of God's people, you know what it looks like to people? It looks like peace. How are all those people of different backgrounds and different personalities and, and, and so forth getting along? It's, it's the Holy Spirit, right? And he, he gets all the glory. So having said that, having said that, Ephesians 5 says this, um, as, as, as it said there, be not drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. So that controlling peace, right, is, is of the Spirit. Now, look at verse 15, because we've got peace as the underlying rule of the church. That's the beginning of good worship, a peace ruling in our hearts, only from the Spirit, meaning that we surrender to the Spirit as we've come together to worship. We're expecting the Spirit to move, and He's ruling, and be thankful. So we have this thankful heart, right? A heart of gratefulness for what God has done. Because the idea, again, in worship is not that we ever have come together to somehow impress God by our rituals, our singing, our preaching, and somehow God will then do something for us because of our worship. That's not how it works. That's how it works in many of our minds that I will worship hard, I will do rituals, I'll make sacrifices, and somehow then I'll please God. No, God's people come together because God has already done something for them and we've already been brought into his grace, and his spirit already indwells us, and therefore our worship is an expression of praise to him who is worthy and the one who has already changed us. So it's a, thanks, thanks, it's a grateful outpouring of thankfulness. And when you think about it, isn't it easier to have peace among a, a, a group of people who are thankful than it is am, among a group of people who are bitter and unthankful? I mean, it just makes sense. When you try to have a good bit of unity, if everybody there is thankful, they have grateful hearts, right? It's, it's going to be easier. We were at T4G this past week, 12,600 believers comfortably packed into the Yum Center, right? And you have these long rows of seats. And sometimes the guy's got to go to the bathroom after everybody's been sitting. And you've got about this far between your knee and the seat in front of you, right? There you are, 20 guys, and here comes a guy. Guys, go to the bathroom. And... <laughs> And, and, and those are the things that irritate us as humans. And we begin to get grumbly, right? And have yum center rage or whatever. <laughs> so the idea is if a heart is ruled by peace and therefore thankful and has a grateful attitude and just glad to be there, you saw that happen. We'd stand up, guys would kind of come in or leave and you'd say, oh, excuse me, oh, thank you. Oh, excuse me, thank you, thank you, thank you. excuse me. I, I don't think anybody said, out of my way. Jerk, good night. Can you move it? Good night. That's my foot. Come on. I mean, so that wouldn't promote too much unity and, and peace. But thankful hearts can say, you know what? Hey, I am thankful. I mean, it may not always go our way. Things might not always be just like I would like it. But I am thankful. I'm grateful. I have a grateful heart because I know things could be way worse. But God's grace has lifted me up. You see what I'm saying? So that's the idea of coming together as a body and having peace rule with a thankful heart. Now, having looked at that, we're going to get into more of the, the nitty-gritty here. So what else does genuine worship look like in the local church? Well, verse 16, we'll continue there. Look what it says. It goes on to say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So what does that mean? Now, some have tried to say that this means a personal, again, inward message from Christ to me. The word of Jesus is in, is, it's dwelling in me. I, I caught a telegram from Jesus just to me and a personal thing. But it's, it's not. In this context, of course, it's, it's talking about a body of people. We're talking about a group as a whole. And, and the word of Christ dwelling in that group richly. Now, the word richly, we can't overlook that. Because the idea is the word of Christ Obviously, these words about Christ. I'm, I'm going to mention a little bit more about that. Matter of fact, that is a huge part of why we're here to hear words of Christ. The words of Christ. Matter of fact, that should hopefully be the only real motive you had in coming here today. To gather every week is to hear words of, of, of Christ. And yet, if if not that then, then we have another problem because now we're coming to get some kind of self-help. And, and this, is, this is what we see here. When, when, when Colossians 1.5 talks about the word of Christ, by the way, it's not just talking about mentioning the name of Jesus, not just saying, well, I'll, I'll talk about Jesus or we'll mention him as a footnote somewhere in our self-help seminar here today. Um, it's talking about this richly dwelling in us, right? And, and, and so the idea here then is the same as we saw in Colossians 1.5 a few, few weeks ago, where it talks about the, the word of the truth, the gospel. He said, receive the word of the truth, the gospel. And what is that word about? It's about Christ. And this is so important that we understand this. The word of Christ, therefore, is the totality of biblical revelation concerning Jesus. That's what he's meaning here. So as we worship, any genuine worship will contain and be saturated with the word of Christ, words about Christ, which is the totality of the biblical revelation about Jesus, who he is, what his mission is, what his life was like, uh, what his redemptive work was, uh, his character, all of those things. So you see what it, yeah, the beauty of this, the word richly, it's not just a cursory idea of this, folks. It's not just that we come to church and we have our self-promotion service about our lives and how we can live better, but we'll tack the name Jesus on so that we can say we went to church. He says richly, the word of Christ in you richly. That means a robust understanding of Jesus, not a, a cursory surface understanding of Jesus. This is what worship is about. As we come together, we are having the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Now, there's two ways that's going to happen, okay, that he talks about here. Two ways this, this can happen to us. Colossians 3.16, again, let's, let's, let's continue reading. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So, as much as some would say, wow, teaching sounds a little boring, or preaching sounds boring, Yet this is a means whereby God has ordained his people to be filled with the words of Christ. How's it going to dwell richly in us if I haven't heard about Christ? How am I going to hear about Christ without a preacher, right? And this is what the church's primary job is, is to proclaim Christ. Peter, uh, Paul said, well, Peter said it too, I'm sure. Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified. That's what he told the Corinthian church. I'm not coming with eloquence of speech. I'm not coming to, to make you feel good or, or even bad. I'm just coming to preach Christ and him crucified. And his spirit will take that and do what he will with that message. But that's it. We must preach Christ crucified to the world and trust the spirit of God to move in the hearts of people. I like what Sam Storm says here about this. Sam Storm says, Paul's point is that we must grant the word of Christ the highest priority and place in the corporate experience of the church. It must be preached, proclaimed, explained, and applied. That's it. The preaching of the word. What did the church do in the book of Acts? As they gathered together, it said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teachings. That was the first and foremost thing. That's the first and foremost identifier of that body of believers. They come together. Why? We want to be full of Christ. We want to hear about Christ. Teach us about Christ. Admonish us about, about Christ. That's what the local church in the world is here for. You know, okay, I've got to stay focused. 
Here's the problem with that. Christ is absent from the majority of pulpits in America today. So the purpose of the church is not just to entertain or make people feel good. The purpose of the church has always been to proclaim Christ. Admonish people in, in Christ. And yet, today, many of the, 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 the pulpits have been, it's, Christ has been replaced by an incessant preoccupation for self-help and self-promotion. Listen to some of the common themes in pulpits around America. Here are the common themes we hear about today. How can I be the best me? How can I enter my destiny? How can I have my best life now? How can I fix my marriage? How can I fix my kids? How can I get along with my coworkers better? And if Christ is mentioned at all in those messages, he's we're reminded that he is simply an aid, a partner in helping us achieve our success, our goals, and our fulfillment. But it's all, basically. Now, I'm not saying these things aren't important, some of these things. We, we want to have good marriages. We want to, to fix the relationships with our kids if they're broken. We, we want to get along well with our coworkers. So I'm not saying those things aren't real and that they're not genuine, they're not important in, in our lives. <sighs> but... The redemptive suffering of Christ for his church, his dominion as Lord, his victory over sin, death, and the grave, his authority over all things as the final judge of the universe has a direct and practical impact on every aspect of my life, especially as a believer. Non-believers just don't know it yet. As believers, this is the center. Why? Christ is my life. If we are a true follower of Christ, we die to ourselves, and we are now alive in Christ. And he is in us, the hope of glory. Therefore, there is no greater topic, subject, object of our love or affection than Christ. And the church's job is to proclaim Christ. I mean, think about it. It's Christ who gives life and life more abundantly. You want abundant life? Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life more abundant. But it's me. I am the life. (laughs) I mean, just in Colossians alone, in the first chapter, in in just eight verses, here's what we see about the supremacy of Christ. I mean, Paul reminds us, it's Christ Who is the image of the invisible God? It's Christ who created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. It's Christ who is before all things. It's Christ who holds all things together. It's Christ who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. It's Christ who in, in whom all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. It's Christ who reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It's Christ who will present you holy and blameless above reproach before God one day. It's, and I guess what my confusion is, if a church is not preaching Christ, then why in heaven's name are they gathering? Why? And another good question is, what do we really call that gathering? Because the Bible is explicitly plain about what an assembly of believers is for and what it's constituted to do, and that is to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. Because we can get a lot of help, self-help, other things, and entertainment. We can get that everywhere. Many of you may be wondering where our fog machine and if our lasers broke today, but the point is we've changed the idea of what church is a long time ago, and we've made it a a market-driven contest. We brand ourselves. We have logos. We've got to be recognized. We've got to do everything we can to pull as many people in to fill these seats. That is not the definition of a church. What God has called his people to do is to make disciples in gathered groups, loving those people. Again, I agree with John MacArthur who who says, I don't know if I want more people because you know why? We're accountable for those people. Shepherds, preachers, pastors, 
who are genuinely called to the ministry understand the responsibility that they must give an account for everyone under their care. More people, I've got enough trouble. I mean, I've got enough people. <laughs> Sorry. I, but I mean, that's, that's the point. So what is, what is then the, the purpose of us then to gathering? Yes, I'm called to preach. I'm called to feed the sheep. That's what Jesus told his apostles. If you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. In these local gatherings, that's what we're doing. But we admonish each other the same way. We're going to see that here, that we, we, we continue to teach each other about Christ. But he's the subject. He's the purpose. So yes, preaching is preeminent. And if a pulpit is not preaching Christ, then again, I question what the motive is for that gathering in the first place. But the second way that we learn, the second way we're going to learn of Christ is through singing. This is amazing. Look at the rest of this verse. Verse 16 again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There's that same formula he gave in Ephesians, the same exact three words. Some have looked at these words and said, well, Paul was just using, you know, just re repetitive words. He meant just singing. That's all he meant, just songs. I think Paul was more precise than that. And, and he used the exact same formula as he talked to the church in Ephesus. I think there's some specificity here. What is a psalm? Singing psalms. What's a psalm? Well, that's easily defined as those songs that are recorded in the book of Psalms. The Psalms contain early worship from our early brothers and sisters in the church way back there, right? And they were singing these songs. And these are called Psalms now recorded in the Psalms. As a matter of fact, there are some churches today that that's all they'll sing are those top 40 hits in Psalms. I mean, that's it. They're not going to sing any other songs, but the Psalms. And that's not bad because they're not too shabby, right? I mean, they're good songs. That's, that's fine. What about hymns then? What, are, what is a hymn? Hymns, as a matter of fact, we see one of the greatest Christological hymns in Colossians. It's, it's the, the first chapter there where it talks of the preeminence of Christ. That is known as an ancient hymn. Many believe that it was customarily sung as a song. So any song that uplifts Christ, pushes us in our minds toward the redemption of God, glorifies him, that's a, that's a hymn. A hymn. That could be a in this instance, that could be a, a modern-day contemporary worship song that is theologically correct and pointing us toward Christ. Could be a hymn that we call today a song that's 400 years old or so. Um, but it's a song that is going to uplift Christ. And what about that last one? Because you think that covers everything, right? You've got psalms, you've got hymns, any song about Jesus or, or glorifying God. And what is this spiritual songs? Why do you put that in there? And I believe, along with many, that this, we're aided in understanding this by the first word, spiritual, spiritual songs. Some believe, many believe this refers to spontaneous spirit-prompted singing. All my Baptist friends just had a quiver go up their back when I said that. <laughs> but it's the idea that as we are hearing, and this is the, the caveat, this is where you have to couch all this. It's not talking about some emotional wild ride and all of a sudden you're just shooting out all kinds of words. It's talking about singing prompted by the Spirit as you are hearing truth. I think one way that we could look at this in our context is I think we've done this before. I think the idea is as you're singing a hymn or our praise team is singing, you'll sometimes as we're in a chorus and we're maybe between the chorus, they may Spontaneously say, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, you are holy. Spontaneous, led by the Spirit, re re reacting to the truth. That, that's, that's that. You, 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 I've heard it out here. That's one way this is. Bob Coughlin, who just, we, those who are T4G, watched him lead. He is known as, a, as one as, as he leads in his local church. He sings spontaneous songs. He has written whole songs spontaneously that glorify, honor the Lord. I think that's a spiritual, that's a spiritual gift. So that's what it's talking about. We've got to be open to these things. But again, as you're going to see here, 
there was a very regimented place for this in that scripture guards all things. So again, we can't just allow only pure emotionalism to take over here. And then we try to use this as a, as a means to show off or to kind of outstage somebody else. That's not it, folks. Genuine worship songs will reveal robust truths of who God is, who man is, and God's redemptive plan and what he has done for us in Christ. I want to say that again because I think it's important. Genuine worship songs will reveal robust truths of who God is, what man is, and what he has done to redeem us in Christ. Wearsby, Warren Wearsby puts it like this. I think it's very powerful. Wearsby says, I am convinced that congregations learn more theology, good and bad, from the songs they sing than from the sermons they hear. Music reaches the mind and the heart at the same time. It has power to touch and move the emotions. And for that reason, can become a wonderful tool in the hands of the spirit or a terrible weapon in the hands of the adversary. And this is true, right? We use... Uh, Songs is a pneumatic uh, memory device for children, right? We teach them the ABCs and every, some people learn the books of the Bible with a little song. So songs, we learn things. We get it in our heads. That's good. It's also bad. If it's, if it's bad theology, it's, it's a bad deal. <laughs> that's why we want to guard our singing here. That's why, that's, that's why we pick the songs we pick and, and Sing the songs we sing. Now, we're not trying to say you have to sing one person's song. We, we, you know, uh, Keith Getty doesn't have copyright laws here. I mean, it, it, you, the Gettys, they, they write songs, by the way. We're not just going to say we've got to sing all Sovereign Grace music or you've got to sing just hymns. But it's about the content of those songs. Whether it's Hillsong or Gettys or Sovereign Grace, they must uplift Christ. They must be theologically correct and they must glorify God. Let me give you an example of bad worship lyrics. Just to give us an idea of how this works. <laughs> this first one, I'll try not to sing. I cannot help it. Man, we, I heard this a lot. They're holding up the ladder that I'm climbing on. I'm climbing up the glory and I'm holding strong. Woo! I'm not done. I'm going to read you all these lyrics. Now just listen. I know that was catchy and you really like that. <laughs> They're holding up this ladder that I'm climbing on. I'm climbing up the ladder and I'm going home. At the top of the ladder, oh, what joy there will be. And the angels are holding up this ladder for me. As I climb this gospel ladder, always heeding every sign, I know my Savior's with me and he's teaching me to climb. Every day, every day that I am climbing, there's a battle for me. Every step on the ladder is another victory that I've won. There's a mansion being built for me somewhere in glory land. And this ladder that I'm climbing is part of that plan. I can hear the angels beckoning, keep climbing, don't stop. <laughs> There's a crown of life. If only you can reach the top. I hope somebody's seen some, some problem with this <laughs> by now. This idea, I'm, I'm doing it, man. I'm going to climb. I'm telling you, folks, if I've got to climb the ladder to heaven, I'm in hell. I'm done. I'm falling off that ladder. I am not going to be able to do it. Here's another one, by the way. That goes to, uh, it's a more modern song, and it says this. In the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour, I wait only for you because I want to know you. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. Now, I know I may be being a little sarcastic, but... I honestly don't know what that means exactly. But I, it, I could say at the end of that, sweetheart. I could say at the end of that, cutie. I mean, it could, who's that singing about? I know, I know. I come across very angry and mean. I am not that mean. <laughs> really. Since I was a little kid, I mean, I've been gruff. And I don't mean to be. My mom we used to record things. And my sister recently pulled out a cassette tape that she had somewhere stored. And it, was, it has come to the light. And I am seven years old, sitting at my, my dinner table with my parents, and my mom recorded this stuff. And I am wicked. I mean, I'm just gruff. Hey, hand me that. Hey, hey, stop. Hey, what is this? I don't like this. Here's something else. Now, I was a sweet kid, I thought. I mean, I, I, in my mind, you know what I'm saying? Could you please pass me that? 
could we maybe have something else? But no, I'm just gruff. I, I, so I apologize. I confess that to you guys. That was a sidebar. Let's go back to preaching. I'm sorry. At any rate, the point being, we've got to be very careful because that song is Gnostic. Uh, that's, that's the point I want to make about that last one. Yeah, y'all, should we not want to be with Christ and feel these emotional things? But that very danger of the mystic type of worship is it's Gnostic in its heart saying that there's some mystical secret place I can get that nobody else can get, I'm gonna, and I'm going to somehow secretly experience all this, this stuff. When God ordained the local church for us to come together and to sing these truths to each other and to admonish each other and to hold each other accountable and to build each other up. Now, yes, again, do not take me wrong. I know we can read our Bibles at home by ourselves and pray, and we are to do those things. But when we come together and sing songs, they are to build up each other and to be robustly theological. Because we're inst- instructing each other in the word of Christ that it may richly dwell in us. That means a strong understanding of who Christ is, what the gospel is, what redemption is. Not some idea of, I don't quite know what this means, but I want to somehow get this meditation idea of God down or, or whatever. So I hope you understand. Let me just give you, okay, let's go to this. Then how about the positive examples? I don't have a problem understanding what this means. See if you do. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark, never failing. I get it. I get that 100. I I know exactly what that's saying, and it's showing me I can rest in the mighty God who never fails. What about this? As, As far as songs that teach me who I am, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Plain, I get that 100%. How about this? Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Denominations have cried recently to take that word worm out. We're not worms. Take that out. You're right. We're worse than worms. He was being nice here. I'm telling you, folks, when we get a glimpse of who God is, the glory the hugeness, the holiness, the majesty of God. We disintegrate, folks. We fall prostrate in his, prostrate in his presence and say, woe am I, I'm undone, I'm unclean, I'm not worthy. And that's what these songs robustly remind us as we sing to one another. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon that tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Another one that teaches us truth. Your word alone is solid ground, the mighty rock on which we build. In every line, the truth is found in every page with glory filled. In Christ alone, we're justified. His righteousness is all our plea. Your law's demands are satisfied. His perfect work has set us free. Those are truths that we sing to each other as a church. And so we teach each other. And that's one of the reasons why a few years ago, around six years, I, I, I guess, we turned the lights on in here. We, we, we realized the church comes together to sing to each other. And there's some power in looking around and saying, there's other Believers that love Christ. And we're singing these truths to God, but also to each other. And together we're bearing witness of the glory and the majesty of the one who saved us. And we're building each other up. That's what genuine worship is supposed to be about. I'm going to be honest, folks, because I can, I can do this from my perspective. We were very seeker sensitive at the beginning. We designed this church, for the, but we kept lights off spotlights on the stage only keep the focus up front and we did a lot of stuff from dancing eagles to rock and i mean it was crazy and we realized wait a minute along with the majority of the church our professed church we're making this hard (laughs) trying to do one more better gimmick or one more better show or event when the prescription has been laid out for us for centuries and centuries preach Christ and him crucified if I 
be lifted up. I'll draw all men to myself. Preach Christ. Make disciples. Trust the Holy Spirit to do the work. And so let us admonish. Let us truly, truly worship. Let us truly say we're here for the purpose. Again, we may not please everybody, but we do not want to be mean. We don't want to just turn people away just by putting false barriers up. But we want to be the church and we want to worship in a genuine way that the Bible reveals. For Because, by the way, worship is for him, not for us. In this sense, folks, we come together not to impress who's visiting, not to impress each other. We're singing songs for the glory of God, and we want him to say, well done. Well done. This pleases me. Ah, sweet savor. Yes, that's good. I know you're imperfect. I know you're mad at her, and I know you're mad at him. And I know, but your hearts right now are surrendered to me. My spirit is moving in your midst, and you're pleasing me. Now, let me just look at verse 16 at the end here. Look what, Here's the kicker, because we can sing all the right words and have all the best theology, and God still say, that's not smelling good to me. I don't like it. Look at the, the last part of this. We'll read it all in context, starting at the beginning of 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So the worship is coming from my heart, a heart that has made, been made right with God by his spirit. I've surrendered to the spirit so that his peace may dwell in my heart. And my heart now, it's from my heart that I am singing these praises, these truths to God. Amos 20, or 5, if you want to write this down, Amos 5, beginning in verse 21, we see what God says about worship that is correct. It's, cor it's, it's, it's solemn, it's correct, it's right. But look, look what he says. I hate I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. He goes on to basically say, until you put into practice from your heart what you believe, and justice rolls down like flowing waterfalls, I'm not going to listen. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus actually quotes from Isaiah when he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So we've got to be careful also, folks, about this. This is why the Bible is so wonderful. God knows us. So not only do we have this admonition to sing truth and proper theology and make sure we're teaching each other and admonishing each other in Christ and focus on Christ, but he also knows we can get really proud about that and our hearts can be removed from that. So he reminds us, but first and foremost, it must be an offering from your heart. What about that? I mean, this is a, a huge lot of, of information. It's a, it's a lot of stuff I know for us to, to bring in in these th three verses that Paul's challenging us as believers gathered in a local church called to do these things to show genuine worship. So let's just end with one last thing here, verse 17, which reminds us that the worship service doesn't end when you walk out these doors. For the people of God, Christ is our life. See, the, po the politicians get it kind of mixed up sometimes when they'll say, well, you can gather and worship in your place, but you can't push, you can't do that out here. You, you know, you can't show signs of that in the world, but you can gather and do your little rituals or whatever, that, but that's not what we're doing. 
what we express in here and the truth that we talk to each other about and the truth that we sing to God about and the truth that we admonish of Christ. The reason we're doing that is we're equipping each other to continue that as we leave here. So the worship service doesn't end. Colossians 17, look what he says. And whatever you do, anything you're doing, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because you see, for us to do anything in our lives for the glory of God is worship. We're worship. We're living sacrifices to him. It's a spectrum word. He said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 10.31 when he said, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. He's not just saying, well, only glorify God when you're eating and drinking. The rest of the time is yours. Do what you want. No, it's that there was spectrum. He's trying to show the, anything, everything you're doing. Here, the same way, word or deed. Everything you do, whether in word or action, that pretty much covers everything, right? Do it all in the name of Jesus with a thankful heart. There it is again, thankful heart. You said, that sounds pretty intrusive <laughs> into my life. You really, Jesus saying that everything I do, I'm, I'm worshiping him? Yes, because he made us for the, the express purpose. The only way, the only, we are made to worship him. That's it. We are made to give God glory. Everything we do is going to give God glory. Or not. <laughs> but it should be our heart's desire that everything it says, here's why that's true. I love, I love this quote by Abraham Kuyper, and we need to put this in our minds. He said this, there is not one square inch in all the universe over which Jesus Christ does not say, mine. It's all his. <laughs> Everything and every bit of me is his. My job is his, my wife is his, my kids are his, the house is his, the car is his, my dreams are his. Everything is his. I mean, think about this. What would my life look like if everything I did was done in the name and for the glory of Christ? And I mean, I was intentional about this because that's what God's calling us to do. This is it. This is what worship, genuine worship is. This is why we come together every week. Encourage each other in those truths. Fill each other up in the words of Christ. And then we leave and we continue to worship in our service by obeying his commands, by obeying his laws, bringing him glory, and bringing us joy at the same time. What would it look like? I mean, how, how would I talk to my kids? How would I talk to my wife? I'll give you time to think about that. That's huge stuff. How would I speak to my coworkers? How would I react to problems? This is, this is huge. You know, you have a chance to worship when, when somebody brings you some bad news or something that you don't agree with or something you don't like, and you want to you respond. I mean, you've got to come back, and you want to just really lay them out, right? Except you don't have to do it. Instead, with the Spirit of God giving you the grace, you return good for evil. You know what God says? That's good worship. Boy, that's, that's pleasing. That pleases me. You're worshiping me, right? I mean, what about, how do I react to even my children's good news? My children have good news. They come, daddy, daddy, boom, boom, whatever they throw out. <laughs> How about this one? When your four-year-old brings you the latest masterpiece. So tempting. And I blew it here a lot. I'm just honest. Too busy, you know. Are you kidding? Brings me this. It looks like crayon went wild on a piece of paper. <laughs> Daddy, look, 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 look. Uh, yeah, man, that's good. Good night. What was that? I mean, that's, and you go on. What about if we think about worship and we think, wait a minute, how would, how, 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 what can I do here to love my child and actually worship the Father? 
And take a minute and say, wow, sweetheart, that's, you spent a lot of time on this. What is it? And they will tell you what it is. <laughs> I mean, every detail about what this is. And you know what we're doing when we're doing that? We're singing over them like our Father sings over us. We're, we're, we're worshiping, and God, God is saying, wow, yeah, that's, that's, that's pleasing to me. That's real, that's genuine worship. I know it's not, I've already confessed, I know it's not easy, folks, but this is what we pray for. This is why we say, Spirit, rule in my life. Make me think about this stuff for your glory. And this is what James means when he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Hebrews 10 reminds us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but rather we're to meet together in order to encourage each other to love and to good works. We're glad to be able to provide these videos as a means of proclaiming the gospel and encouraging Christians in their walk. However, I want to remind you, this is just a supplement to your Christian life and not meant to replace the local church. So I encourage you, find a Christ-centered Bible preaching church and join yourself to it.